de Global Latin Factor Podcast. Welcome, welcome, you and all, to another episode of the Global Latin Factor Podcast, where we talk about Latino, I know you're saying it with me, Latino everything, that's right. Thank you very much for being here, for checking out another episode of the Global Latin Factor Podcast. If you have not done so, go subscribe, go hit the bell, it helps us a lot, it helps us move in the rankings of being one of the best Latino podcasts there is, even though we're already in the list. We want to get higher and higher so we can continue to bring bigger stuff for you all so you can enjoy. If you are on the audio side, we appreciate you very much. You don't understand how much you are helping us on moving these numbers and downloading and everything. So we appreciate it. We did the end of the year 2020 wrap for Spotify. We were all over the place as far as locations, but we really truly do appreciate it. If you're on Apple Podcasts, go give us a great rate us appreciate it very much and social media you already know we're present so thank you thank you subscribe subscribe give us a like give us a like give us a comment and we do we truly do appreciate it you're already here you're already watching us just put your finger down close to where is that click 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 vamonos here we go all right real quickly before we get to this episode i have some fun facts to share with you that i had so this episode we're going to record today, I thought we already had it recorded, but, you know, in the beginning of the podcast, we had a few things that fell off, so we need to redo it again. So we're going to redo this one again, because I thought that we have already done it. So if you listen to the first podcast, and I mentioned this, then you'll be like, what happened to the episode? Okay, well, I'll tell you all about that. First, real quick, fun fact. Now, did you know that a in the mission... In uh, San Agustin in 1565, that's 42 years before Georgetown, Spanish was spoken here in the United States. So Spanish, besides the native tongue, was already being spoken in the uh, U.S., uh, America, way before Georgetown. That's crazy, right? Another fun fact, Spanish colonizers brought the language uh, to the Americas beginning in 1492. Uh, so, so today, what they call the Latin Americas, which refers to the countries, they are subject to the Spaniard, French, and Portuguese, and they bring in their you know languages they have, which are called the Romance languages, which is Latin-based uh, languages, which is Spanish, French, Portuguese, Latin, and I'm forgetting one more, but you know those are called the Romance language, Latin-based languages. So, but that's in the Americas, South America, not the U.S. that they brought the the, the colonizers. Okay. So today we starting with this amazing Latino called Mario Jose Molina Pasquel Enriquez, born in March 19, 1943, in Mexico City, died in October 7, 2020, at the age of 77. Molina had died of a heart attack in Mexico City. His father was Roberto Molina Pasquel, a lawyer and a judge who went on to serve as the ambassador for Ethiopia, Australia, and the Philippines, and his mother was Leonor Enrique. Fun fact. Okay, so you know how sometimes I like I do MC in gigs. If I never told you this, I do. So if you need a, if you need an MC, professional MC, bilingual English and Spanish, hit me up. I'll take care of your wedding. I make sure your guests are entertained, have their time of their life, and you'll be giving us a great review. But in addition to that, so I went and did an Ethiopian. And Mexican wedding. They hired me at Georgetown, actually, funny as it sounds, and uh, Georgetown. And I went to do MCing, so I'm doing my thing. The uh, DJ is from Ethiopia, and he tells me that in Mexico, there's a building named after a city there's in Ethiopia. And in Ethiopia, they have a town or a city that's named after a place in Mexico. And, and we were just, you know, interchanging cultures. I was telling, I was asking him about this. He was telling me about, about that. I'm like, man, we have a lot of similarities. In Ethiopia, they have uh, like 60 plus languages, even though they have a main language that this, the 
the count the the country speaks, most of them have their own separate uh, language because of different tribes that they have. So I thought it was pretty cool that even within Mexico, maybe this gentleman, his father has something to do with it. <laughs> I don't know. But apparently we had a really good relation with Ethiopia even back in the days, okay? He looked up to his aunt, Esther Molina, who was a chemist and who helped him with his experiments. Before deciding to become a research chemist, Mario Molina had considered the idea of pursuing a music career, in particular becoming a violinist. That's pretty hard. Yep, and this is some of the places he graduated. He graduated for the University of California in Berkeley with a PhD. So, what? So, do y'all remember? Oh, years ago, there was a big deal. There was articles, news talking about a hole in the ozone layer that was being caused by I don't know what, and you know it was gonna be. I think it's still a thing, but it's not being, it's not as severe as it was or the way that it was heading. And of course, you can tell now if you're in the sun that it burns way more stronger than it used to way back in the days. So this is uh, the gentleman that helped, uh, talked about this and bring awareness that there was an issue with the ozone layer, Mexicano, and we needed to do something. Well, this gentleman is the one that we need to talk about because he's the one that brought awareness in regards to the ozone layer hole. And uh, this is the gentleman that, that helped discover. And again, Dr. Molina is the one that brought, a, a, a Mexican chemist is the one that told people, hey, we have a problem, you know, he, we need to do something. About it. Hello, quickly jumping in to let you know, I know that you know you are enjoying the show, so go ahead and subscribe, hit the notification bell, and now back to the episode. He played a very important role in the discovery or of the Antarctic ozone hole and was the co-recipient of 1995 Nobel Peace Prize for chemistry for his role in noting the threat to Earth from this ozone layer uh, regarding the uh, CFC gases. And he was the first Mexican-born chemist to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, what is the Nobel Peace Prize? I've, I don't know if you ever heard of the Nobel Peace Prize, but it's a big deal. So the Nobel Peace Prize is not a single award, but five separate prizes that are, according to Alfred Nobel in 1895's will, are awarded to those who are doing and, you know, during the year, do amazing things and, you know, benefit as far as humankind. So the benefits towards humankind, there's five of them. And they award this in the fields of physics, chemistry, uh, physiology, and medicine, literature, and peace. The Nobel Peace Prize are widely regarded as the most prestigious award available in their prospective field. So if you are within this, there's five awards you can do, uh, be one of the recipients. Alfred was a Swedish chemist, uh, engineer, and industrialist most famous for, and this is crazy, and he's known to uh, invent dynamite. He died in 1996. In his will, he uh, entailed that his remaining assets should be used to create this Nobel Peace Prizes, and that's how he started. And the first award was given in 1901. Yeah. Yes. 1901. And Washington, December 9, August 2013, President Barack Obama announced that Dr. Molina was being awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom along with former President Bill Clinton and 14 others. So he received the highest civilian award that you can possibly receive as far as that part. Uh, you know, that's the highest award a civilian could receive for anything they've they done and the contribution to him, humanity, country, uh, security, the interests of the world, and peace, and, and different things like that. So that's amazing that he was able to to do that. And, it, I mean, it only makes sense, right, because, you know, he kind of saved the world a little bit. In his career, Molina held uh, researches teaching in different positions. He teached at the University of California, Irvine, California, Institute of Technology, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, very MIT, very, very famous university, University of California in San Diego, and the Center of 
Atmospheric Science at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Oceanography. Molina was also uh, a director for the Mari Molina Center of Energy and Environment in Mexico City. Molina was a climate policy advisor for the president of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto. Now, this is his word as a child of how he converted his uh, bedroom into his own little laboratory using microscopes and different things, uh, chemistry said that he had. And this is what he said in his own words. Uh, and one, once again, one of his tias, uh, his tias is the one that, that helped him out as far as what happened. Uh, he says, I then converted my bedroom, seldom uh, used by the family, into a laboratory and spent hours playing with chemistry sets with the help of his aunt, Esther Molina, who was a chemist. He continued to work on challenging experiments along the lines of those carried out by freshmen in chemistry, uh, in the chemistry as far as students in college. You know, so that is amazing. Now, as far as keeping with our tradition and sending their children to abroad, he was also sent to, in his family, they, they sent children abroad to study. So he was sent to uh, Switzerland when he was only 11 years old, assuming that he would uh, learn German to help him with his career that he had picked, which was, you know, chemistry at that time. So they sent him to, you know, hopefully learn the language. And, uh, you know, he remembers being thrilled to be in Europe and then the disappointment uh, that the European schoolmates had uh, because there was not really an interest in science. And, of course, he had no Mexican friends to help him out. So at that time, you know, he, you know, began working his, at that time, taking it very serious as far as what he wanted to do and completed um, as far as his career, what he needed to um, pursuing music wasn't a thing anymore for him. And, you know, he, he did used to play the violin all the way to uh, for, for a while before he decided to stop. In 1960, he enrolled in the chemistry engineering program at UNAM. This was when uh, the closest of becoming a physics and chemist, and which was also math-oriented and not available for chemistry majors. So at that time, UNAM is a very known university in Mexico. So he's definitely a global Latin factor as far as what he's able to contribute to the world. I mean, I remember being a big deal as far as the ozone layer. The hole with the ozone layer was like pretty crazy because if we continue to use the chemicals that we were using, it caused a lot of policy change as far as the chemicals. You, you needed to do aerosol change, uh, Freon for cars, all that change, all, you know, they used to use a certain type of Freon, but you couldn't do it anymore because it was harmful for the environment. People used to just let the Freon go, aerosol, chemical, things like that. So if we kept doing it like that, I don't know if we would still be here or we'd be in a very, very bad position as far as, and we still continue to, you know, walk a fine line when it comes to things like that. We still don't, are not very very considerate of the planet. So it's very necessary that we continue to work on that. But it's awesome that a Mexicano, a chemist, was able to foresee, let people know, and because of his findings, he was able to be awarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize for the things that he had contributed or, you know, or a co um co or co receiver for the award and I think it's pretty awesome. Uh, if you never heard of, or knew, didn't know about the Nobel Peace Prize, that's a, what it is. It's not one; it's five, and in different areas. So this is pretty, pretty awesome that we get to deal with uh, somebody that received the Nobel Peace Prize and continue to work for the better of humanity. You know. And now we get into our next segment, which is uh, torta or tortita or titilla, aka corn. Tortilla. Corn tortilla is a flat, rounded, unfermented bread produced from wheat flour or lime. The chemical is CAO, cooked 
mice or corn is used along in uh, a mixture of mice for tortillas. Uh, and um, tortillas is very significant in South America, Central America. So now, there is a particular process that happens with Nixtam uh, as far as getting the tortilla. So it just doesn't pop out as foam corn to a tortilla. Now, processing and the characteristics of flour and maize tortillas differ considerably. Both types of tortillas originated in Mexico, uh, where they are considered to be the national bread and are consumed with other foods, such as beans, meat, vegetables. Tortillas are traditionally uh, are homemade, prepared on a daily basis and consume fresh. So yeah, that is a fact that we are definitely down. Now, the technology for maize uh, tortilla produced was developed in early Mesoamerican civilization. Now, the tortilla and masa produced uh, contribute to a staple food for most people in Mexico and Central America. Now, the process itself is crazy, and we'll talk about it here in a second. Mexico accounts for 42% of the world's production of tortillas in the United States, 36% of Central America, 9% in other countries, and 13%. Maize com compromises of 98% of the tortillas consumed in Mexico and Central America. In Mexico, 40% of the maize is used for tortillas. These are... Uh, there are these are... Now, these figures right here that I just said are older ones. However, in 2002, uh, 2022, the last figure, as far as the market for tortillas, is 26.39 billion, 26.39 billion dollars worth of tortillas, or the market for an estimated, and the projection for it for. Many years later, it's freaking crazy, and I'm going to tell you all about that as well. Now, the place that they say that the possibly the tortilla originated is either Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. And, of course, you know about these timelines, uh, kind of difficult to know, but it's between eight to 12,000 years ago. That's when the tortillas were kind of discovered, and that's how it began. Now, just want to talk about as far as the, the nixamat. Now, the process as far as the, the tortilla and the process for nixamat. So, the process calcium hydroxide to make tortillas is needed and how much is contribute to the nutrition value of the tortilla. Now, the corn tortilla is an extraordinary human invention, coin tortilla by the Spaniards who compared it to a smaller version of the torta, a cake. They knew back home this was a small round cornflake pack with a hefty punch of nutrition. Now, now thanks to the process of nixtamal or nixta, nixtamalization, <laughs> tortillas are rich in minerals like calcium, iron, magnesium, and provide essential vitamins like A, B, and E. They are also a good source of protein and fiber. Now, Corn itself is all right, like nutrition wise, but when it's with the nixtamal, it's like it's it's freaking crazy how it much elevates, and just that chemical reaction of doing that nixtamal process and nixtamalization, it catapults like the things that are beneficial for the tortilla, and it's crazy, it's crazy to know that that they came up with it that. Somehow they discover it. Now, corn appeared in history as a cultivated source of nutrient in at least 8,700 8, years or 12,000 years ago in Mesoamerica, where the creation of the story of tortilla began after the indigenous culture of these regions learned to modify teosinte, which is a type of wild grass, into a corn they began the process of corn into masa or dough, which again, that was the nixtamal. And then they did this through the uh, ingenious method called, as we mentioned earlier, nixtamalization. They soaked the corn uh, kennels in a lime water solution from limestone, which removes the holes, made, made it more easier to digest and help the ground corn form dough instead of turning into some kind of mush for tortilla making. 
So it has its own texture as far as what it is. The resulting mixture of masa is called nixtamal, as I mentioned earlier, an Aztec word for harmony. Interestingly, the chemical process of mixing corn with lime releases a crucial, vi release crucial vitamins that is otherwise unavailable, otherwise unavailable to the human body when the Europeans learn about the farm uh, and the natives in the New World back in the 1500s. They failed to copy the process of nixtamal, so they took the corn back, but they just thought the people cook kind of strange, so they did not bother to learn that the corn itself is okay as far as consuming it, but putting the nixtamal in it releases so many other additional minerals and vitamins that is so much nutritional for you, uh, fiber, uh, protein, all that stuff. It is crazy to me that they even figure out that you can do that, that somehow you can put all these things together and then like mix it. This is my theory. And this is just a straight up theory as far as what I think happened. Okay. So check it out. This is all me creating stuff and stories in my head. I'm like, it's, I'm kind of trying to see what is the smartest way or the smartest or the most logical path as to how did they discover that corn, you can mix it with limestone and then something happened. Okay, so my theory is that they used to take the corn and they used to cut the corn and they used to go wash it by the river. By the river, there's limestone. And when they were doing that and they started mixing by accident, all of a sudden they started noticing there's something was happening with that. So they started experimenting like they do even with crops. They take the better crops and, you know, mix them up and get the better batch of the, of the crops. Some people might call it GMO even back in the days, but just taking the better crop and making it better. Well, they noticed that for whatever reason, this made something. And they started implementing it slowly. And before you know it, they started noticing that it created a, a some type of, of masa or, or, or uh, dough that it was firm enough that you can make something out of it. And they already knew how to cook. Before you know it, you have tortilla. Very simple, very makes like I'm made, well, I'm making it up. But to me, it seems like the logical idea as far as what could have happened or how would they discover? Because how can they even... Or maybe they didn't even know about the vitamins. But seeing the chemical reaction of the washing the corn mixed with the mixed with the limestone that was already close to the river because there is a limestone by the river, then they realized they started doing some kind of something. And before you know it, they took that and ran. And here we are. We enjoying tortilla. And we don't even think about the fact that how is it that they discover that you can mix it with limestone, the corn with the limestone, it creates nixtamal, and then from nixtamal you can, you know, find it down, like grind it down, and you make a masa, and then you have a freaking tortilla. And, like, that's mind-blowing to me that, and, again, we're talking about global Latin factors. So, as I mentioned earlier, their market as far as tortillas was 26, uh, 26 billion, uh, 39. However, it is expected that 37 billion are to grow as far as the market for tortillas by 2032. So in about 10 years, that's what it's looking like. Now, the demand for tortilla is growing in developing countries as well as developed nations due to the nutrition, no average, and rising concerns about being uh, as far as health and consciousness in North America. So... I think it's a better option than bread. So that's just me. The tortilla is a staple food in Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, and part of Costa Rica. And again, there's even Asian nations. This is some of the places that you can find tortillas. Latin America, of course, Europe now, uh, South Asia, East Asia, and Oceania. So these are some of the places now where tortilla are found. So when I talk about the Latin factor, how things from the Latin from the region of Latin America to the world, we bring you tortilla. That's like almost kind of sort of my definition of what it means that they took something from or we brought something 
and created something which I don't know the exact origin, but one can kind of sort of make theories and began to cook, even though the colonizers looked like it was kind of funny, but still it was something that it was nutrition, it was healthier, uh, provided minerals, vitamins, and then to this day it's expanding as far as where it's going. Tortilla is not going anywhere anytime soon, and it's elevating even higher with the easy trade and with people being more conscious that tortilla is not a bad deal if it's just the tortilla without the additional added uh, nutrient. I'm sorry, preservatives. Not to mention you really don't need to add too much to it because it already preserves itself pretty well without adding additional stuff. So that's pretty freaking cool to me. I think that, you know, that's definitely, you know, a global land factor. And final thoughts as far as uh, Dr. Molina, I mean, starting from a kid to making his own uh, room or bedroom, a uh, little chemistry set. If you have desires to be a chemist or getting into that, you have a love for the science and stuff like that, man, that's somebody that you can look look up into. Uh, as far as tortilla, man, <laughs> talk about global, 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 all over the world uh, and expanding. And it's all thanks to the Latino community, the, the area of Latin America that took this right here that is one of our, you know, utensils really, because if, I don't know if you know this, right, but sometimes we use the tortilla, we make like a little scoop and that's how we used to eat our tortillas. We don't, sometimes we don't use utensils or maybe we use just to push the whatever you're eating into the tortilla so you can eat something good. But other than that, it's freaking crazy to me that you could travel all over the place and continue to expand it. And in all things to all these beautiful Latin American countries, the Americas, to the world as a global Latin factory. So that's amazing. All righty. So thank you very much for checking out another episode of the Global Land Factor Podcast. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the channel. You already know what to do. You're already here. Give us a like. Give us a follow. If you're on the audio, go follow us. Go leave us a review. And thank you very much for being here. And remember, we are just like you. We are the spice in this melting pot. That it is the world. Until next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for checking out another episode of the Global Latin Factor Podcast. Make sure you go and subscribe to the channel. You are very important. It means a lot to us whenever you go and subscribe and hit the bell so you can get notifications whenever we have new episodes. It really does truly mean a lot to us. Thank you very much. Walks like a pedo, but in fact he's a flamingo Coming to Havana, Henry from Puerto Rico On a pirate ship, he don't know where do we go The birds of the jungle chasing fortune and fame but one